Good morning. My name is Commander Andrea Cameron, and welcome to this virtual conference about the national security significance of climate change. This is our third conference with a new theme of naval climate engagement. I welcome you all to this event. First, let me direct you to the events page. You can download the conference program for this event on the events page, and the link is in the chat. The conference program has the full agenda and the biographies for all of our participants. As I mentioned, this is our third conference for the national security significance of a changing climate. The first conference, Risk and Resilience in the 21st Century, was a call to action exploring solutions about a changing climate and what it means for your country, your service, your career field, and for each of you personally. Our second conference was operationalizing climate security, and it asked how each of the geographic combatant commands were integrating climate into their mission, strategy, planning, and operations. We're excited to host this next installment, looking deeper at foreign partner engagement with navies. So I'll set the stage today with a little background of how we got here. With Executive Order 14008, tackle, tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad, we launched the US government's action into climate change on January 27th, 2021, almost two years ago. The progress in the last two years has been driven by our national and defense strategies. For example, our national security strategy mentions climate more than 60 times. The national defense strategy states that climate change and other transboundary threats will increasingly place pressure on the joint force and the systems that support it. Recurring climate themes like agility, resilience, adaptability, and sustainability are meant to keep our forces at peak performance. Within the Department of Defense, building on the national climate guidance are the DOD Climate Risk Analysis and the DOD Climate Adaptation Plan. And since those were published in 2021, each service has now released their own approach to climate. The Department of the Navy's Climate Action 2030 seeks to build on a climate ready force through climate resilience and reducing the climate threat. Our climate vision aligns with the One Navy Marine Corps Team Strategic Guidance by Secretary Del Toro, as well as the Chief of Naval Operations Navigation Plan and the Commandant of the Marine Corps Planning Guidance. All of those are intended to enhance readiness and capabilities of the Department of the Navy as a global maritime power. And Climate Action 2030 is an important step in how we think about opera operating the naval force in a climate altered environment. I've put the links to those documents in the chat. Now, Climate Action 2030 pursues climate change efforts that strengthen maritime dominance and power our people and strengthen strategic partnerships. Now, to accomplish these goals, we are working internally across the Department of the Navy, as well as with Naval allies and partners around the world. So why is this year's conference about Naval climate engagement? First, being part of the Navy Climate Working Group and at the US Naval War College, I thought this was an excellent moment in time to share our progress over the last two years. Second, we have a persistent recognition that our progress must be in sync with our allies and partners, all moving in a similar direction while our, we adopt our own climate strategies. For this reason, not only do we highlight our developments today, but we also talk about the essential foreign partner engagement that is occurring in these respective areas. Now I'll mention a final thought that comes from my own climate security research. Countries around the world are planning climate action to meet their Paris Agreement goals. Each country has their own unique perspective on how to include their ministries of defense into these national goals. These ministries of defense are executing policies and they're just starting to permeate down into the services like the Army, Air Force, or Navy and Marines. Now, like all my conferences, I, this event is designed to share where we're at and propel the conversation forward about how navies can start thinking about climate change. I'm truly honored to bring together this service-specific event to our broad audience. 
To start us off today, the Naval War College Provost will welcome all of us and introduce our keynote speaker, Vice Admiral Rick Williamson. Joining the keynote speaker is our high-level discussion speakers, Raul Mulbady from the Royal Navy and Ms. Deborah Loomis, the Senior Advisor to our Secretary of the Navy for Climate Change. After they all speak, we'll have the opportunity to take questions for them. After a short break, we will look at key areas of interest like science and technology, contingency engineering, and public health and vector-borne diseases. These are areas where we're making significant progress and have an international engagement. The event will conclude by 1130. Before we proceed, I have to thank my conference sponsor, Professor Peter Dombrowski, the William B. Ruger Chair of National Security Economics, as well as the Naval War College Foundation for sponsoring this conference today. It is through their generosity that today's event is made possible, that it's free and open to the public. As a reminder, the full conference program with the agenda and bios is on the events page and the link to that is in the chat. This event is being recorded and will be available on the Naval War College YouTube page after it has concluded. So to kick us off today, I'd like to introduce our own Naval War College Provost, Stephen Mariano, to welcome us. He has a distinguished military and academic career, most recently served as the Deputy Commandant and Dean of the NATO Defense College in Rome, Italy. He served on the faculties of the School of International Service at American University, National Defense University, the Royal Military College of Canada, and the U.S. Military Academy. He holds a PhD in War Studies from the Royal Military College of Canada. He is now our Provost at the U.S. Naval War College, and we welcome you today, Provost Mariano, and we look forward to hearing your opening remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea, and welcome everyone to the National Security Significance of a uh, Changing Climate Conference. This year's theme, as and Andrea mentioned, will focus on naval climate engagement. Um, I'm honored to be invited to do uh, this kickoff uh, and excited about the session, uh, but first I'd like to make a few uh, welcomes. Uh, first, as you've already heard, uh, I want to welcome uh, Vice Admiral uh, Williamson. So we're excited to uh, see you online uh, again, uh, although it's a long way from your office in the, in the Pentagon, but I'm glad we could bring you uh, here this way. Uh, uh, Admiral Williamson is the Deputy Chief of Staff, of, uh, Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Fleet Readiness and Logistics. And as I'm sure you're going to hear, he's got his hands full with programs in the Navy uh, having to do with climate change and the impact on primary uh, and, a, and a large part on our facilities. But we're also going to hear from Rear Admiral Paul Beatty, the director of the Naval Staff of the British Royal Navy, and from Miss uh, Deborah Loomis, a senior advisor to the U.S. Secretary of the Navy for climate change. Also want to welcome our active and retired flag officers, uh, our Naval War College Foundation participants again, and thank you for your support uh, to foundation. To all our alumni that are connecting online out there, to our academic partners, our very own faculty members and students uh, from across the college enterprise. I'd like to also add my thanks to Professor Dombrowski and the foundation for their contributions to make this, this all work. And as Andrew mentioned uh, as well, these things don't happen by themselves to so our events team, audio visual team, public affairs and graphics team always make these events a success, whether they're online or in, in physical presence. Um, I should also thank Andrea. Uh, she's obviously done a lot of work to put this series together and particularly this conference. And it's also worth noting that Andrea is a winner of a Fulbright scholarship and will be on her way to uh, Brussels, uh, Belgium uh, very soon. So congratulations, Andrea, and thank you. So welcome, welcome to this uh, Naval Climate Engagement Conference. It highlights some of the major progress uh, into how navies can modernize in the future operating environment altered by climate change and the importance of working with our allies and partners along the way. In fact, what I'm gonna do to add to Andrea's in the chat box is a NATO document uh, that uh, Secretary General put out, NATO put out last year, and their assessment of the impact of climate change on NATO. So I'm here to kick off the conference today, not only because of the importance of the topic, but also because of the work, uh, the dedication and work of the faculty members at the Naval War College and the Climate and Human Security Studies Group and the students uh, from that elective. They've been doing uh, a great job in better understanding climate and human security concerns and the impact on our national security. So our, our role at the Naval War College is to inform today's decision makers and educate tomorrow's leaders. In fact, that's something Admiral Williamson and I talked about in his office uh, last year when I was 
being introduced to my work and trying to figure out how we could build relationships across the Navy staff. In today's dynamic security environment, numerical and technological superiority are no longer enough. We need to outthink our adversaries. At the Naval War College, we expand the intellectual capacity of Naval Joint Interagency and International Leaders to achieve that cognitive advantage. Our objective here in Newport and around the globe is to deliver excellence in education, research, and outreach, and build enduring relationships with our alumni, uh, allies, and partners. The Naval War College is committed not only to conducting research simulations and academic coursework in the field of a changing climate, but when appropriate, we also want to be a leading voice within the Department of Defense and among other international militaries in working to improve our abilities to better understand these changes. We do produce graduates who can think critically and creatively and apply military power to these problems. We develop graduates who have the education and foundation to discern military dimension, anticipate and lead rapid adaptation, who are trained to conduct joint operations and have a foundation in strategic operations. We're developing leaders who can use the same knowledge and skills to help discern changes in any campaign that they are assigned, including changes in the climate. The Naval War College Climate and Human Security Study is a small slice of what we do here, but an important study that educates and deeply researches and conducts outreach all over the world. And it's evidenced by over 100 of you online today. Our professional military education prioritizes ethics in our study, and therefore the War College sees value in our climate and human security study group and electives it to be in great demand. And the Naval Climate Engagement Conference, this conference, invites you, top scholars, to be involved. So my challenge to all of you today is to open your minds and think outside of your own area of expertise, to listen and think critically about these important topics and provide feedback in the discussions to one another uh, to make our discussions as meaningful as possible as we drive towards a better understanding of how navies can operate in a climate altered environment. Thank you very much again to everybody for participating, particularly those uh, that are organizing the event. Uh, I hope you have a successful discussion. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Vice Admiral Rick Williamson. Uh, Admiral Williamson has a long career as a surface warfare officer. It started early at the Naval Academy, I recently understood, as a, which included some uh, quarterbacking of the Naval Academy football team. Uh, his early sea assignments include tours on board the USS Dewey, USS Briscoe, the USS Enterprise, the executive officer of the USS Rodney M. Davis. He commanded the USS Simpson during NATO's uh, Standing Naval Forces Atlantic uh, 2004 deployment to the United States, which was the first visit by a NATO uh, ship to the United States after 9-11 and an operational function. Under his command, the Simpson won two Battle E awards. Ashore, his assignments include tours in Washington, D.C., in the District of Columbia, uh, as an executive assistant to the Commander of Naval Installations Command and as Deputy Director of Plans and Policy. From 2008 to 2011, he served as commanding officer of the Naval Base San Diego, one of the small ones I think the Navy has. Uh, and during his tour at Naval Base San Diego, was selected as the 2010 Prince Presidential Installation Excellent Award winner and the 2011 Presidential Green Government Award winner. From 2016 to 2019, he served as commander, Navy, Region Europe, Africa, Southwest Asia, Maritime Air Forces in Naples. Admiral Williamson assumed duties as Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Fleet Readiness and Logistics in June of 2019. And when we met, he reminded me about a misnomer of the title of <laughs> Fleet Readiness and Logistics. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about that. Sir, it's good to see you again. Uh, everyone, please join me in welcoming uh, Vice Admiral Williamson. Sir, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, sir. I appreciate that very kind and making me feel very old introduction. Uh, but I'll, I also want to thank you and Professor Cameron for inviting me here to speak um, on a very important topic. Uh, Ms. Loomis and I have spent hours uh, in my office and her office talking about um, climate resilience, uh, the environment, and how it affects our our Navy. And so uh, little did I know my passion for this uh, really began at Naval Base San Diego. Uh, I am a warfare officer, and so therefore, uh, you know, our focus and my focus has always been on mission and our people. 
But uh, if you're the commanding officer of a base in Southern California, it doesn't take you long to understand the significance of uh, water and power into your operations and how to do things. So our world is changing. Uh, we see that every day with uh, more frequent storm events, uh, weather events, uh, melting ice caps, rising sea level. Um, you know, these things are threats to our ability to operate, uh, both to the mission and to our people. And so I think it's imperative that we uh, not make this a program that's a standalone or um, or something that is uh, focused on separately from the mission and our ability to perform that mission when called upon. And so um, my team and I, uh, working with lots of other people, have incorporated this not only in how we um, look at problems, uh, but how do we innovate, how do we share, how do we collect information to ensure that we are always uh, protecting the mission and our people. And those partnerships and stuff, and I know Ms. Loomis is going to talk about them later. I had the opportunity in the warm up to see some of the briefs, so I, hopefully uh, I tee those up nicely. Um, um, it also includes our allies and partners. Uh, we can't do anything without uh, our allies and partners. And so uh, I think, Hopefully what I say will kind of resonate. And so it, climate does matter. It matters when we're building our Navy, when we're training our Navy, when we're operating our Navy. Um, you know, as these things increase the frequencies of extreme weather, uh, flooding, drought, wildfires, what impacts does it have on our mission? Can we codify that? Can we respond to that? And can we plan not just in the, you know, against the immediate threat, but also project to the future and look at how we do how, how we do there. Can we look into the future and understand the impacts these things will have on our ships, our submarines, our airplanes, our bases, our allies, our partners? And can we develop plans which allow us to do our nation's bidding? And, you know, just some examples I'll, I'll throw out. Uh, you know, we had Hurricane Sally hit Pensacola, Florida, very slow moving storm. But because of how slow it moved, uh, we had a five foot um, uh, surge. Uh, and we also had two feet of water and uh, you know sustained winds for a long period of time. If you put that on an infrastructure, which you know started as far back as the early 1900s, uh, when these things didn't persist like they do. It causes potential. Now, why is that significant? It's significant because Pensacola, Florida is the birthplace of naval aviation. Every brand new ensign that wants to fly an airplane comes to Pensacola, Florida. They start their journey there. They then move through the Southeast uh, region, which I had the great opportunity to be the commander of. And so the relationship, not only to Pensacola, but the other bases, Meridian, Kingsville, uh, Kings Bay, or uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, Mayport. And so when you look at that, you know, you know, we also have to understand that um, not one size fits all, right? That these things have an impact to our ability to generate not only the pilots, but Pensacola is also the home for our maintenance training for our young uh, enlisted folks. And so how do we learn from that and how do we move forward? Um, you know, another great example on the West Coast, uh, you know, uh, is uh, NAS Point Magoo. Uh, we had a, a wildfire, uh, severe drought, where we lost 1,200 acres of prime training uh, and maintenance uh, capability, not only at uh, NAS Point Magoo, but also at Camp Pendleton. Um, you know, sea level rise in my uh, region before I went to Europe was uh, at, at Naval Station in Norfolk. Uh, reoccurring flooding there, uh, you know, the systems that are built to support the base, steam systems. Every time the water gets over, it generates water hammers and causes uh, critical impacts. That, again, impacts our surface fleet and their ability to do maintenance and things. Uh, so, you know, understanding those things and staying ahead and planning for them are vitally important to the Navy. 
But we also have to look at this thing kind of holistically. It's not just a region by region event. It's actually a world uh, event. And we look at the melting ice caps, you know, uh, that's open up scene lanes of communication. Those scene lanes communication obviously get uh, attention in Moscow and Beijing, and it opens up, uh, you know, potential for a new uh, territory for great power competition. And so we need to be uh, focused on these things. The other thing, uh, my portfolio, obviously, uh, installations, but I also, in my logistics uh, hat, look at the platforms, our submarines, our airplanes, our surface ships. And so uh, a little bit later on, I think you're going to get a brief uh, on how climate is beginning to affect the way we look at these platforms and how we develop them and yeah. the, the, the environments in which they're going to operate. Uh, additionally, those platforms, we don't want them to contribute to the problem. Uh, as my role as the, you know, being the person that answers our chief of naval operations, hey, Rick, can I do logistics in a contested environment? I think we saw during COVID uh, any kind of friction to our supply chain, our distribution network. It also impacts our ability to operate. It also impacts our um, our uh, our people. Uh, our ships, uh, as they operate near the equator and the temperatures go up, are our ships designed to be able to withstand, you know, those temperatures, be able to clear the electronics to make them lethal when called upon? And then uh, the other part of my job, uh, the infrastructure, the base infrastructure. Uh, you know, the sea is a, uh, on a good day, is a challenging environment. Uh, just the nature of being a Navy means we have to be close to the coastline. Uh, can our base withstand drought? Can they withstand flooding? Can they withstand these things? And are we building back better? And so all of that to lead in, which I think is a very fair question. So what is the, what is the Navy doing? And and like I said, I mean, uh, anybody can uh, throw money at a problem. Anybody can come in with a rah-rah attitude and change climate of toward a situation. I think this has to be a culture change. The culture change means that this climate resilience, this, this ability to be able to respond to what the planet is doing us, uh, doing to us or for us um, has to be embedded in everything we do. And earlier I said, uh, at least I challenged my people to say, hey, this is not a standalone program. So when we're looking at the, we get the opportunity to build Pensacola back. Are we doing that in the right way? Have we put it into the process as to where it's repeatable? And as we move forward, we're taking in consideration, not only building it back better, uh, through our uh, unified facility criteria, you know, that in NDA language, it says, hey, you're building, you know, you're in the process of building back Norfolk uh, Naval Shipyard, and I have to build it back to 100 years. Is it possible to build it back to the 300-year threat? Can we do that? And we actually have done that. Now, that requires a lot of things. It requires data. It requires modeling. It requires uh, dedicated people. It requires uh understanding their surrounding environment. And what I mean by that is, you know, you learn this if you're the CEO of Naval Base Norfolk. Every single day, 188,000 people come on uh, to uh, Naval Station Norfolk. Uh, and then Naval Station Norfolk is, I, I can make it a citadel, but if the surrounding communities, if I'm not cooperating with them and learning from them and sharing with them, then it doesn't do much good to be Naval Station Norfolk. Right. You've got to be able to communicate and have those things because I'm depending on those 188,000 uh, people to make us lethal. So how do we lay that into our plans? Every one of our bases, uh, every one of our regions have a region master plan. It is in, uh, informed by the DOD climate assessment tool. Uh, it's informed by uh, studies out of our uh, Naval Facilities Command. It's informed by local government. It's informed by universities. It's informed by a lot of things, but it's incorporated into that plan. And then it drills down into the individual base plans. Uh, and we encourage our uh, commanders uh, 
to you know find more information to bring into this as we look to gain resources to go forward. Um, in addition to that, you know the partnerships we find. Um, you know it's always good to use other people's money, uh, but if we can combine our money, particularly toward a problem, then I think it gives us. Uh, more buying power. It also opens up that kind of concept of uh, innovation. And one of the things, you know, to share a couple of examples there. Again, direct, you know, always finish the sentence with the impact to operation. And so do you look at uh, Naval Station Yorktown, munitions handling, our ability to search uh, and get munitions on to, into the fleet fast happens at Yorktown. Erosion, uh, you know, um, sea level rise. Uh, kind of taken from us. So being able to partner with uh, uh, Virginia Tech University, uh, University of Virginia, uh, the Chesapeake Bay uh, Society, uh, and our base environmental people, is there a way other than building a berm that we can, you know, obviously we can build a berm, we can be a citadel, um, but that's good. But great is can I accomplish, accomplish the same thing with uh, a natural oyster bed, a natural oyster reef, uh, grasses that uh, stimulate not only uh, regeneration, but also uh, helps uh, build back, if you will, using nature to put back the soil that was moved away. Uh, and that's been very successful for us. Uh, when we look at uh, you know, uh, I mentioned Norfolk Naval Shipyard. Uh, that shipyard, not only do we look at it from a sea level rise, but can I look at it from uh, energy consumption? Can I look at data and digital to be able to reduce the amount of energy that I'm using or carbon footprint that I'm producing? All those things are embedded into our plans. Matter of fact, it's part of our standard checklist now. Uh, we're very closely with Admiral Vanderlei, our Navy facilities command, and we call it cradle to grave project management. And before those projects are uh, uh, brought up for approval, those questions are being asked. Have you considered the environment? Have you considered energy consumption? Have you looked at innov innovative ways to solve those problems? And so we're making some tremendous progress there. In addition, one of the other things that uh, we just talked about yesterday, Animal Vandalay and I, is how do we pull in, you know, uh, you know uh, this communication uh, to the outside, you know, to universities, to our industrial base? Um, you know, or have we looked at everything that's out there to be able to mitigate any impacts these things may have on us? And so we're pretty excited about that. And then the other part of my portfolio, logistics, and this really uh, climate logistics uh, and this concept of endurance kind of go all hand in hand. And uh, I'm not a smart guy, but I have some really smart people and I pay attention to them. And so uh, when our fleet goes to sea, we go to sea, we know how much food we have and we know how much fuel we have and we know how long those things will last. And so I talked about earlier uh, the impacts of friction caused uh, during COVID. Uh, now that could be the impact of uh, heavy weather. Uh, it could be the impact of uh, drought. It could be the impact to a lot of things to our mission. So this concept of endurance is how do I look at the problem and figure out how, what methods can I use to uh, get a cleaner burning fuel that lasts longer, that uh, a ship's captain does not have to be dependent upon the log chain, and it gives him the freedom of maneuver to accomplish that mission. Those two things can live in harmony. Those two things should live in harmony because it gives us an operational advantage. And if we look at our distribution and our supply chains, and we have the ability to map them, and we have the ability to articulate the problem to our industrial base, our partners, um, to universities to other government agencies and say, hey, this is the problem I'm trying to solve. This is why I'm trying to solve it. And here are the things I want you to consider. Now, anybody can, you know, we can figure out, we can solve problems, but we have to be smarter because what we don't want to be is we don't want to be a contributor 
to these uh, to any of these things through greenhouse gases and these other things. So uh, we work very hard to do that. And then uh, the last thing I would tell you, and it gets kind of gets back to these two things in harmony and what I have observed by being able to communicate with my fellow DCNOs at CNO, Ms. Loomis, the secretarial, is that, um, you know, when we see the opportunity uh, to increase our operations and protect our people, uh, because, of, you know, whether it be anything, but in particular, in this case, we're talking climate and stuff. Um, you know, where we had to fight in the past for resources or opportunity, now that's just becoming natural. Uh, but we can prove it through data. We can prove it through our, uh, our, our studies. We can prove it with our plans. We can show them where we're going to be 10 years, 20 years from now, and why we're taking those actions that we are. And the thing that is, uh, I am very happy with as uh, the person answering the question uh, to the CNO, are we building our bases back? Are we considering the environment? Are we considering the impacts we have to the environment? Are all those things in that plan? The answer is yes. Have I looked at logistics, uh, not only in a contested environment, but have I considered my supply chain, my industrial base? Am I asking all the same questions of those? And then when I expand that and I talk to my allies and partners and uh, share with them, um, you know, and we have great relationships there because they're suffering and feeling the same impacts we are. I think there's a tremendous opportunity to grow. And so I look uh, very forward to the questions. Uh, I'm very happy and thank you very much for asking me to be a part of this. Uh, and uh, hopefully I set you up okay. I'd like to express my deep thanks to Vice Admiral Williamson for sharing his thoughts today and leading us into the th key themes of the conference. He described the need to look at the future and understand our impacts to ships, submarines, aircraft, installations, allies, and partners. He said that on a good day, the sea was a challenging environment and planning for climate change is vitally important to the Navy and it will take a culture change. What is the climate doing? It must be embedded in everything we do. And I particularly liked his thoughts that when he talked about climate change, we always wanna finish a sentence with the impact to operations. He added to this that solving this would create operational advantages. Vice Admiral Williamson, thank you so much for sharing your leadership and experiences with us. Now that we've heard from our keynote speaker, let's go straight to our high level discussion with the United Kingdom and the United States. After this, we'll take a break for, followed by an in-depth panel highlighting different areas of focus for the US Navy. To get straight to the discussions, I'll moderate the panel myself and include introduce our speakers only by their current titles. After our first three speakers, the Vice Admiral and Rear Admiral Beatty coming up and Ms. Loomis, we will take questions in the Q&A box. So please enter those at any time. Next, I would like to introduce Rear Admiral Paul Beatty, the Director of Naval Staff from the Royal Navy. I had the pleasure of meeting him and presenting at the Royal Navy's First Sea Lord Symposium last May, and I'm honored and looking forward to hearing what has progressed within the Royal Navy since then. Welcome to Rear Admiral Beatty. We look forward to your presentation today. Thanks, Andrea, and th thanks for inviting me, and um, thanks, Ms. Loomis and uh, Admiral Williamson for your leadership in this area. It's, um, Great to see, and it's great, great to be talking about this, and it's great to be back in the and the War College fold. I mean, that's the Newport behind me, if you can see it in the picture there. Um, so, what what I thought I'd do is I'll, I'll take us down down a level a little bit because I think um, when Andrew and I discussed preparing for this, I thought what would be helpful is to see how one of your sort of key partners is approaching this, and I and I think from um, the Admiral's introduction, there's a lot of a lot of similarities, unsurprisingly. Uh, and a lot of areas where we are driving towards together. I think I'll just, I'll perhaps skip over those and, and focus on, on areas there. I can see that perhaps we, we know, do need to focus on the future. So so I, I think the first thing that um, I'll sort of in, open with, and I, I guess I'm always surprised that, probably not in this audience because of, because of the attendees, but I'm often asked, why does the Royal Navy care about climate change and sustainability? Why are you taking this so seriously? And, and I think the answer, you know, you, you'll see my boss's words, the first Sea Lord's words there in front of you. 
but but it, but as Admiral Williamson said, it's it's all about operational advantage, and I sort of break that down for us into four distinct areas. The first one is we're clearly much smaller than the U.S. Navy, but we we're still a global navy. We still want the ability to operate uh, anywhere in the world, and we still um, retain and and drive to sustain a permanent presence in not only the Atlantic, but also the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. Uh, and to be able to operate from the Arctic to the Antarctic and in all those areas, we need to clearly understand the impact of the climate, what's going on and be ready for the future. I think the second one, uh, and the first sea lord captures it in that statement there, is the climate change will increase demand for navies. I, I don't think there's any question about that, given what we see already and what we're going to see in the future. What I'm very keen to understand is the how, where, and when, and to make sure that we have the right capabilities going forward to make those changes. The third one is to adapt to ensure that we are operally, operate, can operate effectively in that change world, and to embrace the new technologies to make sure that we retain that operational advantage. And again, uh, the Admiral touched on alternative fuels, cleaner fuels, different fuels. I think to me, it's a real area of opportunity rather than threat. And final, the one, and the one that's probably least talked about, is about our people. I strongly believe that if we are to be attracting and retaining the very best um, that UK society has to offer in terms of talent, we have to not only be um, playing an active role in actually uh, dealing with the impact of climate change, but we must not be contributing to it. I think if we are, then, then we've got a real risk of difficulty in terms of uh, our people and what they understand um, going forward. Can I go to the next slide, please? So, so we've come up with um, with with a plan. Um, it's a, a a sort of three phase plan. You won't, you won't be surprised, and it is consciously left to right. Now, you know, many programmers out there will will want to know, you know, what is your end state? Are you going to be absolutely net zero by twenty fifty? What's your path to that and how are you going to drive it forward? We've consciously taken a, a sort of three-phased approach that is a build phase out to 2025, that from now until 2035 basically embeds those changes and then allows us to accelerate. And the reason we've gone for that left to right is that with very few exceptions, um, do we truly know what the answer is? Our view is that we basically have two years uh, to get ourselves in a position where we are ready to embrace the changes, we understand what we're going to drive forward, and then we will have to adapt. Um, we don't know what the legislation is going to be in the space in five or 10 years time. We don't know what the technology is going to be. And therefore being agile enough to be able to incorporate and embed and drive those forward is, is not only our, our aspiration, but actually is the fundamental part of our plan. Um, next slide, please. I won't, I won't um, dwell on this. I guess it's just to show you, you know, almost as I sort of summarized in, in that last piece. So, you know, where I think we are today, which is, or, you know, in, in the bottom left-hand corner, when we kicked off this piece, we have got pockets of excellence. Uh, we have got people driving um, quite significant change and taking things forward. Um, but what we haven't got is the coherence and, and the drive to, to sort of look right across the entirety of all those areas to make sure it's coherent and drive forward. And in the top right hand corner is our vision, our aspiration and the end state that we will be with in 2025. Um, that's where we aim to get to. That's where we're trying to drive to. And that's what we'll do over the next two years. Now, I, I'm not going to go through all, all sort of nine levels, lines of development, because I think in a, I'd rather spend more time in the questions and the discussion. Um, but, but I will just touch on some, because Admiral Williamson did touch on some, and I think it's important. So if I just go to the, the next slide, I'll pick out a couple, perhaps. Um, so the first one is on data. And, and I think um, we, we now have uh, very clear uh, emission tar uh, target reductions or reduction targets from UK defence. Um, we obviously have an understanding, a pretty good understanding of our emissions across our state. Uh, but in the operational space, I, I don't think we are quite there yet in terms of a really detailed understanding of the true impact of our platforms and how we would reduce that. Uh, and that's one area that we're really trying to drive forward, uh, not only ourselves, but, but actually leaning into commercial maritime who have much greater ex experience and expertise in this area in order to try and to learn from them. Um, 
the Admiral talked about culture. Um, the phrase that I use here in U the UK is that the, the Climate Change Sustainability Change Programme is UK Defence's biggest change programme. It just hasn't realised it yet. And my view is that that statement is true, not because of the amount of money that we're going to spend on it, not, not because, you know, it's, it's the difference of sort of, you know, um, sail to steam or steam to diesel, but because it touches absolutely everything we do. And I think the, the piece that I'm probably most optimistic about is the culture and behaviours. I mean, there hasn't been a, a, a sailor or marine that I've talked to in driving this programme that isn't all, not only supportive of the change, but is really keen to do what they can to make a difference. And the networks that we have um, across the service and across defence in this space are, are just bring out loads and loads of really exciting ideas on what to take forward and what to change. This is an area where we're definitely not making change to our people. It is our people that drive in the change in the organisation. And I have even used the brief phrase of, um, I, th I think in climate change sustainability, it's, it's not an area where there is a frozen middle. You know, that often used phrase about change programme. Um, it's an area perhaps if we were super critical, there is perhaps a frozen leadership. Next slide, please. Um, I'll focus, I think, on the operational capability and force development one, because it, 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 is, it is the hardest and the most significant. And, and I think, you know, a couple of things that I would um, just wish everyone to have a think about and, and perhaps to consider. The first one is, is on the force development and the planning piece is, I mean, the Admiral talked there about, you know, planning for 300 years. I think when it comes to across the force, you know, when we're planning for that, that next generation submarine or that next generation aircraft carrier, what we need to be really clear is, is what environment are we planning for? Are we planning for an environment that is two degrees warmer, three degrees warmer, four degrees warmer? Um, we're gonna have to make that decision here in the UK quite soon, because I think otherwise there is a danger um, that we do end up investing in platforms that actually are, are not, as I said at the beginning, not designed for the environment that we wish to operate in. But it's also important that we, we don't get that wrong. Um, you know, that will come with cost, that will come with quite significant design changes. And therefore making sure that we have um, gone for the right uh, number in that space and driving that forward, I think is really important. And that's the sort of place where ideally we'd all be doing the same thing. You know, this wouldn't be the UK on two degrees, the Dutch on four degrees, the Italians on six degrees. We'd all have a common standard in terms of our future programming um, as we drive forward the design. Uh, next slide, please. And then I think, you know, it would be inappropriate for me not to, fo to focus on allies and partners. I mean, that's what, what the conference is about. And it's, it's great that you've invited me. And thank you for the opportunity to speak and to, to offer my view. We are very clear here in the UK that we, we cannot do this alone. I mean, we, I think we have a pretty good uh, baseline. I think we have a pretty good approach to this and driving this forward. But this is an area where we are going to have to work uh, bilaterally, multilaterally. We're going to have to work regionally in order to try and drive forward uh, the right solution. And uh, as the provost said at the beginning, I think this is an area where NATO is going to have to stand up. You know, those, those groups that, you know, perhaps have not been recognized or seen as, you know, that important when it comes to the NATO Future Capability Group or the NATO Fuels Group, they are going to have to offer um, direction, guidance, even orders in order to make sure that we retain coherence. I mean, we talk with great pride uh, in the UK about the Carrier Strike Group 21, uh, the support provided both by the US in terms of the US Marine Corps and the US Navy and embedded platforms, uh, ships from, from the Dutch. You know, a task group that went all the way out to the Indo-Pac and back to the UK, you know, delivered a significant effect and actually um, brought in, I think it's more than 20 nations at a time to basically contribute and make part of that group. Now, the, the, thing, the thing that we are all used to as sailors, we, we, we're used to interoperability challenges and that task group had interoperability challenges. It had interoperability challenges in terms of training, weapons, communications, crypto, all those things that, you know, over, over the last 30 years, I've become very comfortable about. What it didn't have was ever any interoperability challenge about energy or fuel. And if we're to get this right, it, things will stay like that. You know, we won't find ourselves in 10 or 15 or 20 years at a time where we cannot actually work as closely together as we can today because we've chosen different solutions or we've chosen different approaches.
Um, so that's me, Andrea. I, I, I think that's a sort of sharp and sharp pitch, but hopefully it lays out uh, where we are, where we're trying to go forward, uh, and some of the opportunities, the challenges as I see them. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rear Admiral Beattie, for this introduction to the Royal Navy's climate work. Uh, the UK's Climate Change and Sustainability Program is a global leader, and we're thrilled that you shared your important naval initiatives. I'm totally impressed by the nine lines of operation over two years for those of us working in the Department of Defense. We understand how hard it is to work on so many different lines of effort at once. Next, for a U.S. high-level perspective, I'd like to introduce Ms. Deborah Loomis, who is the Senior Advisor to the U.S. Navy, uh, Secretary of the Navy, with her focus area of climate change. Ms. Loomis leads the Navy Climate Working Group and has spearheaded the Department of the Navy's Climate Action 2030. You can find the link for that again in the chat. Ms. Loomis, thank you so much for bringing your expertise to this discussion today. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. Uh, what a thrill to be talking with Vice Admiral Williamson and Rear Admiral Beatty. Both are legends and I admire them both tremendously. Today, Admiral Williamson, I have a new quote from you. Uh, this is good, can we do great? And that is a clarion call and it really focuses kind of the heart and the mind on, on who we need to be to solve this challenge. And we're gonna need to be great and do great. So thank you for that. I've written it down and I'll post it above my desk to keep me keep me focused on eyes on the prize. Uh, as, as Andrea said, this past spring, we published Climate Action 2030. It was the Department of the Navy's first comprehensive strategy on climate change. Um, and in that strategy, we reiterated, as DOD has stated several times before, that climate change is an existential threat. And those are not empty words. It is not a someday threat. It is here today, happening now. In the American Southwest, despite the rains that we are getting in California these days, the American Southwest is in the worst prolonged drought recorded in 1200 years. Europe this summer experienced its worst heat wave recorded in 500 years. Yesterday, it was reported that the Greenland ice shelf is seeing temperatures not seen in a thousand years. We saw epic flooding in Pakistan this summer, our own Mississippi River, kind of the, a, a crucial artery of commerce in this country. The flow was so constrained that it actually limited the number of ships that could navigate that river, slowing down and adding to supply chain woes. The military services, as Admiral Williamson and Admiral Beatty uh, already relayed, are not immune to these threats, to these impacts. We are spending billions recovering from stronger storms, and our bases in the West are facing increasing water challenges, just like the rest of the region, and I could list many more. In our strategy, we built a big tent, kind of like what Admiral, both admirals were saying, that this has to be a culture change we showed how climate, climate change is impacting so many of the things that we do across the department. And likewise, how people in every corner of the department can help make us stronger and help solve this problem. From public health to education, wargaming experts to data analytics, base master planners to logisticians, to those who design and acquire new weapon systems, Everyone has a role to play and everyone can make a difference. In Navy speak, this is an all hands on deck evolution. And to the point of culture change, you know, there, there is no silver bullet on climate change. There is no, you know, people ask me, what's your big goal? What's your North Star? And there is no, I can't just say, you know, let's create one gigawatt of renewable energy and, and that'll take care of this problem. It really is everyone looking and trained and kind of cognizant in their corner of the world, looking to see what they can do. We are building on a strong foundation. The Navy and Marine Corps have been leaders in areas for several years, Excel and so we are accelerating those actions today. Areas like generation of renewable energy, microgrids, advanced batteries, and natural infrastructure. 
In Climate Action 2030, we were very clear. Strength in war fighting and preparing for climate change go hand in hand. Everything we do to prepare for climate change must make us a stronger force and make us more secure. We are a stronger force when our fighter jets can be refueled in the air by unmanned aircraft that stay in the air longer and refuel more planes than manned refueling aircraft. We are a stronger force when our tactical vehicles are hybridized and can operate off backup batteries rather than burning fuel when they're idling. That means those vehicles can go further on a tank of gas and require fewer fuel convoys and resupply missions to stay in the fight. We are a stronger for fighting force when we can generate renewable, quiet power on the battlefield, power that, we can, that can move with us rather than being shipped from home, and power that does not make noise or generate a thermal signature like diesel generators that enemies can use to pinpoint our location. We are a stronger fighting force when we use software that helps us optimize where and when we refuel and that optimizes our ship routing to make our transits more efficient. All of these examples and many, many more make us less reliant on fossil fuels and the logistical vulnerabilities they present. They make us better warfighters while reducing our carbon footprint. Climate investments also make us more secure. By that, I mean more resilient, more able to take a punch and to get up quickly when we are knocked down by any disruption, whether it be extreme weather, a cyber incident, or just an act of vandalism or physical attack. Just last month, outside of Fort Bragg, a giant, a big army base in North Carolina, vandals just shot up an electrical substation and thousands were left powerless in that area, powerless without power for several days. So the, the threat can come from climate, it can come from many different things, but when we make ourselves more resilient, we are stronger and more resilient to all of them. We are stronger when we have microgrids that allow us to use independent sources of power and continue our mission even when that civilian grid goes down. We are stronger when we have things like healthy coral reefs, healthy dunes, marshes, and sea grasses to lessen the impacts of waves and prevent debilitating erosion. We are stronger when we build buildings that take advantage of design features that maximize passive heating and cooling and proper insulation and building envelopes so we can invest in smaller HVAC systems and enjoy lower utility bills. We are stronger when we, can, when we assess how extreme heat is impacting our force's ability to train and conduct maintenance as we face an increasing, not just increasing temperatures, but increasing numbers of days at sustained high temperatures that impede our ability to do maintenance outside or to do um, you know, very intensive training outside. At the end of the day, all of the investments that we're talking about come down to force modernization and risk management. A wise mentor of mine once framed for me three lenses through which DOD and the Department of Defense, Department of the Navy can move the needle on climate. I think there are others, but the three are useful. The first two we've already talked about, talked about one, we can reduce our own carbon footprint, reducing our emissions and drawing down carbon. This is an important part of our strategy. It's also part of the UK strategy, which Admiral Beatty did not touch on today, but we know that we cannot as a globe, as humanity, just rely on reducing our emissions. We must draw down carbon at scale and both in the Department of the Navy and in the Royal Navy, we are blessed to manage lands that we can harvest, that we can harness to do that. The second lens um, through which we can move the needle is the resilience of our bases and the surrounding defense communities. As Admiral Williamson touched on, you know, these problems do not stop at the fence line and we most must and do work closely with our surrounding defense communities. The third lens through which um, this mentor of mine said, and he argued was the most impactful lens, was actually working with allies and partners to increase the resilience 
and reduce the, the potential geopolitical instability that climate change presents, because that's where the rubber meets the road. This is a fundamentally destabilizing threat for humanity. When we are thinking about the and experiencing the water insecurity, food insecurity, mass migrations that we are already seeing, this is going to end up on our doorstep as the nation's 911 force, one way or the other. So I think this third lens is tremendously important. I devote a lot of my time and energy to talking about it, um, highlighting it, and more importantly, the Secretary of the Navy really understands this lens, and he has sort of taken action on this lens. He has been talking about the impacts of climate when he travels all over, especially in the Indo-Pacific. He understands that for small island nations in the Indo-Pacific, nations that are incredibly important partners for us in terms of access to their facilities and their partnership in general, that for these nations, climate change is truly right now existential. Seknav gave a speech at the University of the South Pacific in Fiji a few months ago, and he centered that speech squarely on climate change. And some in the Pentagon, this was not conventionally a smart thing to do. Some in the Pentagon, very senior advisors said, what are you, what are you talking about climate change? You need to talk about lethality. And what Seknav understood was that for these vital partners, climate change is their existential threat right now. And what they wanted to hear from us was how we were gonna partner with them, how we were taking it seriously, how we who have caused a lot of this problem, we in the developed world have caused a lot of this problem are taking responsibility for our actions. And that is exactly what SECNAV did, highlighting our climate strategy, highlighting what we've already done and what we're committed to do. Um, and the person who at the University of the South Pacific who thanked him for speaking there uh, was actually in tears as she thanked Seknav and said, and she said, the United States is finally listening to the Pacific. So this, this topic resonates um, across the world. And, and today I'm happy to focus a lens on those allies and partners and those geopolitical impacts. Uh, I will just highlight briefly the three areas that we'll be touching on um, today. One, science and technology partners. We have someone from the Office of Naval Research. We have partnerships um, across the world. One is the Asia Pacific Technology and Education Partnership Program, and we partners, partner with universities across the Indo-Pacific Indo region. Second, public health. And this is another one that I really like to focus uh, a greater lens on because it doesn't get as much discussion in the climate context. But about a year ago, um, 200 medical journals came together in an unprecedented move and identified climate change as the biggest threat to public health across the world. And um, in the Navy and Marine Corps, we run a big public health and medical system and we are leaders in this space. So I always like to highlight what we're doing there and raise awareness of this. And finally, um, our CVs, our uh, contingency engineering. We do billions of construction all over the world and Increasingly, you know, as, as Admiral Williamson and as, as everyone said, we can do this construction with an eye towards building resilience of those critical partners. So I will stop there and really look forward to the discussion. Excellent. Thank you so much to Ms. Loomis. I'd like to invite Vice Admiral Williamson, Admiral Beatty, and Ms. Loomis to keep camera on. We will spotlight all of us as we take a few questions for the next few minutes. So Vice Admiral Williamson, would you like to Take our first opportunity. Yes, ma'am. We have a question in the chat about supporting allies and partners with a kind of a tangible example. So either hmm. something you've you've done or something you think we could do more of in the future. Yes, ma'am. I can give you one uh, very, I can give you, shoot, I can give you several from my last job of uh, Europe, Africa, and Southwest Asia. Uh, two, Twofold. One, uh, Djibouti. Um, uh, you know, a little bit underdeveloped outside the fence line. Uh, trash burning uh, was the approved way of uh, doing things. Uh, we very quickly identified that, uh, you know, not only the environmental aspect of that, uh, you know, when I'm talking burning, I'm talking about burning everything. Um, 
Um, and winds don't always blow in the right direction. So therefore there's an operational significance to the safety of our, uh, our people uh, at Djibouti and also uh, our mission at Djibouti. And so we were able to partner with the Djiboutian uh, government um, and uh, be, you know, recycle through our system a lot of things that they were burning, uh, be able to dispose of properly a lot of the things that they were burning. Uh, and then um, uh, work very closely with them again in Djibouti. A lot of people don't realize this. I did not realize this, that the Red Sea actually has hurricanes. And, uh, you know, when you lose your Kayla, uh, there's significant uh, operational impact there. And so we started working with the Djiboutians, um, you know, uh, you know, we had to stop the erosion quickly. So obviously we took the approach of, barriers and things like that but in addition to that we introduced them fishing is obviously very big and so i mentioned the thing we did at yorktown the other thing that with the marshlands you also get the extra benefit of the wildlife coming back which is very important to them particularly you know uh their population a uh, way to make money a way to feed themselves so there's a couple of examples there um uh, from a, a logistics perspective uh, I can give you one more if it's okay. Um, you know, uh, Paul talked about uh, fuel. Um, you know, there is a tremendous uh, opportunity, I think, uh, working with our allies and partners, right? Being able to come together and introduce, you know, I'm just the conduit to introduction uh, to some of the uh, things that we're doing. But being able to con connect those things, I think, uh, to Paul's Point. I, I, we don't want to get to the end of this, and I can't work with the Brits. I can't work with the Australians. I can't work with the Japanese. I can't work with them. So, you know, probably more so than anything else that I do, uh, that collaboration, not only is it good for us as a, a planet, but it's also good for operation. Um, and so I uh, hope that answers the question. Excellent example, sir. Thank you so much, especially the point about interoperability during the energy transition. Uh, Rear Admiral Beatty, uh, this question was specifically asked for you uh, to get a UK perspective on this. Um, I, I think uh, specifically to US audience, I mean, we're, we're, we're used to the US leading, you know, in, in most areas. And uh, I think we've always been really quite comfortable with that. And uh, we, 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 the UK, probably some of my European partners, perhaps, perhaps some of them are less so, but I think we've, we've always been very used to that. And I, and I think, um, I guess that's really what we would, we would hope for in this space. I mean, I think, you know, I, I, I can't remember the exact stats, but I think it's something like the Royal Navy uses one thousandth of the one, not point zero one percent of the total maritime fuel consumption. I think the US Navy is about one percent. So, so the, the partnerships in this space are not just military to military, which is really important and a, and a bit that we can drive forward, but I think is also that commercial maritime. Um, you know, we're doing a little bit of work ourselves with the Marisks of this world uh, and other companies to sort of understand the direction of travel they're going on to so that we're not surprised. But I think, you know, I think the Navy's working together collaboratively to do that, to make sure that we have a single picture and an idea and that when we go to take the decision, because it, it is a big decision, I think it's going to be multiple fuels run single fuel. Uh, but we go to make that decision. We make that decision together because I think otherwise, um, I say, we, 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 we've talked about the risks that we see. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Ms. Loomis, would you like to add? Interoperability is the, is the big point. Um, so I won't, I won't dwell on that as, as both admirals touched on it. Uh, you know, Interoperability also comes down to facility sharing and ability, you know, forward basing. So I know in the Indo-Pacific, we're doing a very, not we, but the kind of combatant commanders are looking very carefully at those facilities and the impacts that they are going to suffer from climate change. So that's where our contingency engineering dollars come in, uh, looking at airfields, uh, ports, um, in our, in our, then you can add on a layer of innovation. One of the initiatives that we're carrying on is like, how do you use more materials in situ, you know, without lugging cement across the ocean? How do you do kind of like use local materials? Maybe it's 3D printing, like other things, innovation 
again, it's not for climate change, but if you are, you are greatly reducing your logistics burden and your carbon footprint rather than lugging cement across the ocean to try to repair airfields, et cetera. And there's, there's very many lenses. So you've got your four allies and partners, you've got innovation, you've got reduced carbon footprint. So a lot of these things kind of intersect, but that's another example. There are many more from a humanitarian perspective, you know, HADR, they're just, there's just an endless ways that we, um, we work with allies and partners. And I think one thing I wanna highlight for the Office of Naval Research, our scientific partners are, are also very important. You know, we've worked with like Vietnam and the Mekong Delta, looking at sea level rise. Uh, we look at that for our, for our own operational purposes and it's very helpful to them. And these are true scientific exchanges, whereas I think some of our, our adversaries might kind of have a, mo a more one way approach, but we are mutually respecting and learning from one another. So I think that's a fundamental difference in the way we work with our allies and partners. Thank you, Ms. Loomis. I'm gonna combine a couple questions because the, the intent of the questions is, what is what's next in the policy environment? For example, are those, uh, lines of operations out of the UK going to be in a UK Navy climate strategy. And Ms. Loomis, I know that you're working on the Navy implementation plan. So I'd just like each of you to offer if you if you have kind of upcoming work that uh, you will be announcing soon. Uh, yeah. So it, to implement the climate strategy, we are uh, we have developed a campaign plan, which will be coming out and sort of really taking it down to the, what are we doing by when? And I was interested to see Admiral Beatty's approach and the UK approach of like that first phase till 2025. It really is just like, we're thinking along the very same lines, those quick wins, um, assessments, taking stock of where we are, building foundations for where we are, because you know something, we wanna electrify everything. That's great, but we have very old electric infrastructure. So you know to sort of need to be, build that backbone before you can like put all the bells and whistles and everyone can come charge their electric vehicles on the base. You need to make sure that you have the architecture, the you know the the backbone to support that. The analytics we've built out a lot of dashboards to really to see ourselves, to say so like you know by hull number. Okay, we've got. We've got this energy efficiency measure on this ship. How's it looking compared? And so we're building out those foundations as we speak. We're also doing that not through a glossy or a campaign plan, but to Admiral Williamson's point, we have to embed these in processes. So we've reestablished kind of a shore policy board where we bring together um, things that are kind of laid dormant, where it, and it also typically focused on energy, and we're now broadening it because we recognize the intersection and the really water, as I, as I often say, climate change comes down to water. <laughs> it's the management of water, it's too much, it's about the water cycle. And so really water is super critical and we're bringing that into policies. And, and so there, there's many other ways, but uh, yeah, lots of action on the policy front. Thank you, Ms. Loomis. I'll go to Rear Admiral Beatty, and then I'll let Vice Admiral Williamson have the final word. Rear Admiral? Okay, so so two, um, UK defence, I, I think the next the next big piece we'll see is um, a strategy on operational energy. So that, that work is ongoing at the moment. We expect that to report um, by the summer at the latest, which will will look across the, the joint force and, and the likely operational needs and potentially lead us towards some of those choices, you know, including small nuclear and synthetic fuels and drive that forward. I think that'll be very helpful guidance to us as a, as a department, you know, with, as the Navy to understand exactly um, where the department goes on that space and what we do. For us, it, it's, it's the phase two plan. You know, the phase one plan was about getting us ready. The phase two plan is about that sort of funded deliverable um, changes. Um, and that's the piece of work that we're doing. I, I, if I give you a deadline, I won't make it. I, we're, we're aiming for the end of the calendar year. Um, that's our drive, but it's clearly uh, dependent on a lot of other bits of information in order to be able to deliver that. But that's our aspiration. Thank you, sir. Vice Admiral Williamson, you get the final word. Yeah, I talk, uh, obviously, by the way, Deb, that was great. Um, we, Deb and I talk quite a bit. Uh, and so uh, the policy, uh, being able, I think a couple of things she said, one, you know, having the right policy and the policy also has to be agile enough to respond to the foundation. She talked about, um, you know, electrification uh, and talked about the status, you know, we've got to bring our utilities in, uh, up. Um, and so 
uh, having the policy now, I see it as my job to uh, embed that in process. So one of the things we're doing right now is going through and looking at the guidance that my office provides down. And, uh, you know, none of this is going to happen unless that culture change happens at the deck plate. And the people at the deck plate, we've got to educate, right? And we need to make sure that they understand that the policies and processes and how they work and intertwine with each other. We talked about base design. If I want to electric, uh, you know, go to electrification, then what information am I giving the commanding officer of a particular installation that would allow him to drive to the changes and move the needle, if you will, uh, on uh, you know the dashboards that Miss Loomis is making, and so there's a great partnership there, right? Um, so bringing all this together at the flag level within the Navy, but then also uh, trying to get them to understand that, hey, you know, we got a lot of flag officers. That's great. We set the field up. This has to be done at the deck plate. Well, how are we helping the deck plate? How are they see, finding themselves in this problem? How are they helping us solve this problem? And hey, everybody wants to be a part of a winning team. I want to see the needle move at my base. And so, um, yeah, I think that, you know, we tie those things together. I think you will start seeing some significant change. Fantastic. I'd like to express my thanks to Vice Admiral Williamson, Rear Admiral Beatty, and Ms. Loomis. Fantastic keynote presentation and high-level discussion today. Thank you all for your time and energy dedicated to this subject. We will take a short break. We'll be back at 1020 Eastern Time. We do have some questions in the chat. I invite the speakers who just presented. If you'd like, you can go in and look at those and, and answer them in written word. Thank you all for joining us. Again, we will go on break until 1020. Hello, welcome back to our conference today. As a reminder, the full agenda and bios of all of our speakers are downloadable from the Naval War College events page. And I put that page in the chat. The event is being recorded and will be available on the Naval War College YouTube site afterwards. We'll also have a conference program which will have the slides from this panel. Our second panel today looks at three different areas with Naval focus. Our first speaker is talking about science and technology. So I'd like to welcome Mark Spector from the Office of Naval Research, Advanced Naval Platforms Division. Welcome, Mark. We look forward to your presentation today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Commander Cameron, and for the Navy uh, War College team uh, for putting this event together. Um, I'm uh, really honored to uh, represent the uh, Naval Research Enterprise, talk a little bit about the role of science and technology um, and uh, the role science and technology can play in addressing um, the significant challenges we face um, as a nation and as a Navy uh, in response to the climate change. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, sit at the Office of Naval Research. Uh, just a quick overview for anyone not familiar. Uh, ONR is the scientific uh, um, wing of the uh, U.S. Navy established in 1946 and just celebrating our 75th anniversary. And as you uh, see, we, we uh, conduct research for a number of reasons uh, or at a number of levels. Um, we look at, um, we have applied research that addresses science and technology uh, needs of our current fleet, um, which providing advanced capabilities um, to win the current wars. We spend a lot of our time looking at uh, fundamental research to uh, address the future needs of the Navy and uh, things like our large innovative naval prototypes to really provide game-changing technologies in the way we fight and operate. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the way we uh, prioritize our programs is to look at uh, guidance um, from, from all sor sorts of sources, from um, the defense strategy, um, all the way down to uh, the COCOM s and priority gaps. In the area of climate change, um, we've, there's been a lot of recent guidance that's come out in the last year, 
And a uh, large part of my responsibility is I've been trying to uh, understand where the science and technology can play a role in addressing um, the challenges outlined and the goals outlined in these various strategic guidance. Um, next slide. So the way um, I look at the problem is in, in two areas that uh, where we can make an impact um, in the area of mitigation. Uh, looking at the ways we can reduce our impact on the environment in the in our operational um, use of of fuels, et cetera, that uh, emit greenhouse gases. And then, as both admirals emphasized, um, the importance of resilience to be able to um, develop pl future platforms that are more adaptable, uh, can withstand uh, cl climate extremes. Um, and and the, uh, really some of the unknowns out there, understanding the unknowns. So in the area of mitigation, next slide, um, my which is my primary area, uh, I work in the um, Advanced Naval Platforms Division within the Sea, uh, sea Warfare and Weapons Department, um, where we have a very platform-centric view of, of what's uh, uh, of the Navy and, and looking at uh, future technologies that can impact our platforms. Um, we work on uh, on on uh, mitigation. We work on on energy efficiency technologies, and I'll give a few highlights. Uh, we look we look at new emerging opportunities for low carbon technologies, um, and we look at things like uh, uh, refrigerants that were uh, uh, mentioned um, in some of the earlier talks. I sit uh, next slide, please. So I sit on the power and energy um, focus area team, um, and I'm not going to go through. Uh, all the programs that reside within this this uh, science area, um, but our goal is the goal of uh, of this program is really to increase the uh, the the efficiency and of the power generation distribution and 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 uh, control uh, in order to enable um, future capabilities on our naval platforms from uh, high power um, sensors, radars. And and directed energy weapons. Um, we're trying to really uh, push the power limits of uh, of, of our ships. Um, and while the primary goal is not energy efficiency, that's often a byproduct of these areas. Um, for anyone interested in any of these technology areas, I refer you to our website, which I'll show on the last slide, and and it provides context and more details about all of these programs. Next slide. Um, now, in the in the area of uh, greenhouse gas emission, we recognize that over ninety five percent of our operational greenhouse emissions comes from uh, exhaust from burning uh, fuel. Um, a large majority of that fuel comes from gas turbine engines, which tend to be uh, pretty low efficiency. About twenty five percent of the fuel energy going in result it comes out as uh, usable uh, work. Um, I don't like to use the word waste that we're wasting the rest of that energy, but uh, because it's that that power is dictated by thermodynamics, um, the power output. Um, but there are pathways to improve uh, energy efficiency, um, and a lot of those are, go on in the commercial world. Um, and we look to leverage a lot of the industrial work going on. Um, we have programs looking at ways to uh, improve the thermal efficiency of our engines through higher temperature operations. We're looking at uh, combined cycles to try and recover some of that heat and do useful work with it. Um, but all these uh, efforts uh, come usually typically come with uh, serious uh, size and weight penalties um, and are difficult to integrate onto the tight into the tight constraints of a surface combatant. Um, that the reason we go with uh, gas turbine engines is because of their high power density and uh, extreme reliability. Um, but of course, that comes with the detriment of efficiency. So that's uh, some of the science and technology programs we have are looking at that. Uh, next slide. And we are starting to look at uh, alternative fuels, um, as has been mentioned by some of the previous speakers. Um, we think that there is potential for using hydrogen, uh, maybe not as the primary fuel uh, uh, to power our ships, but at certain under certain uh, platforms uh, to be able 
the ability to generate hydrogen in theater, um, et cetera, is, it makes, makes it an attractive fuel. Um, so part of the emphasis of today's workshop is on partnerships. Um, we recognize that we're not the lead in, in developing hydrogen technology within the U.S. Department of Energy is, is, um, is investing quite a bit in this, and we hope to leverage those investments, particularly in the area of, of being able to produce um, green hydrogen. Um, and they have a goal of getting it down to a uh, dollar a kilogram, which a kilogram of hydrogen is about the same energy contact of, as a gallon of diesel. Um, that would make it very tractable. Uh, I'll just highlight one of the areas we're investing is is um, looking at a hybrid hydrogen powered vessel. Uh, Scripps Institute in California is designing right now uh, a research vessel, and, and we're helping out to support some of the design um, efforts there to understand, you know, logistics, safety, distribution, et cetera, all the challenges that people recognize with using hydrogen as a fuel. Uh, next slide. Um, we're also investing a lot in in um, in um, the blue carbon um, effort to not just capture carbon, but be able to capture it and convert it into something of use, converting it into a variety of synthetic fuels. Um, we're looking at doing some 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 large scale demonstrations in the next few years um, in order to produce that fuel. Of course, that is based on the availability of uh, green energy to power this. Um, and so that's tied with some of our renewable energy efforts um, to generate that fuel. Uh, next slide. Um, although less of a uh, overall uh, greenhouse uh, gas emission uh, um, uh, um, impact, we do have we do use a lot of um, refrigerants um, on shipboard, which have high very high very high GWPs. Um, and are also um, sourced, becoming more difficult to source. And so we are investigating alternatives uh, to those refrigerants, both uh, other, uh, lower GWP refrigerants and alternative cooling technologies. Next slide. So in the area of climate resilience, um, we obviously uh, uh, have had over the number of years, large programs in, um, in climate science um that goes on in our uh in our uh oceanography and and battle space environment uh department um but we're starting to look at some of the challenges associated with uh platform resilience to climate change to address uh some of the issues that admiral Beatty brought up um on on if we have to operate in higher temperatures um higher sea states how's that going to affect the way we design and build uh, our platforms in the future. So moving into the next slide. Um, again, I'm not, I'm not uh, in the climate science area, but that area, we have large programs headed by uh, Tom Drake's department um, covering the entire spectrum of, of uh, climate from you know, uh, uh, the high altitude environments to uh, subsea surface. A lot of work on understanding um, um, uh, what goes on at the interface, the sea water interface, and and also the uh, sea the land sea interface. I, mean, I think there's ex there's renewed interest or, or increased interest in trying to understand um, extreme weather forecasting, um, uh, forecasting extreme weather events, um, both in the near and long term, um, and how climate uh, change is going to be impacting that and and that thus how that impacts the way we operate um a lot of work also um on the in the uh, arctic region understanding how uh climate change is impacting the uh the sea ice um uh, melting and how the and and um you know how that's going to affect the way we operate in the arctic ocean um as as the sea ice continues to diminish due to climate change uh, next slide. Um, so moving into the area of international partnerships for my last couple minutes here, um, in the area of climate science, um, there's there's a, a hu huge number of, uh, of partnerships going on uh, with within Code 32, um, and this is just a few examples of that. 
Um, and Deb talked about uh, work in Vietnam to understand the the, uh, the impact of climate change on the coastal uh, regions there. Um, and, and that's just one example of the many programs going on in, in uh, climate science. And I'd be glad to provide contacts for anybody interested in more details on these programs. Go on. Next slide, please. Um, and then the way we, uh, one of the ways we interact with our NATO partners is through the Applied Vehicle Technology Panel within the NATO Science and Technology Organization. Um, I sit on the Power and Propulsion Technical Committee to represent the U.S. Navy. Uh, we have a number of activities looking at, at, at fuels. Um, one new activity, go ahead to the next slide, I think this is my last slide, is a new exploratory team that I stood up in, in collaboration with uh, my Canadian partners. Um, and we're assessing some of the issues I've already mentioned on, on waste, what, what is going to be the impact of climate change on our on our military platforms and also ways that we can uh, mitigate that. Um, with that, I think I'll wrap up. And the last slide will point you to our website and I'll be glad to uh, field any further questions in the discussion. Thank you so much to Mark Spector for this introduction to the Office of Naval Research's work in science and technology. I'm really impressed with the many categories, particularly when it comes to power and energy innovation. Now I'd like to introduce Ms. Robin O'Connell, Director of the Climate Change Program Office at the Naval Facilities Engineering Systems Command Headquarters, NAVFAC Headquarters. And she's gonna talk about Naval Contingency Engineering. I look forward to hearing what she has to say. And I also wanna mention that her colleague, Vince Sobash, the NAVFAC Chief Contingency Engineer will also be joining us for the Q&A uh, Q session. But first we'll start with Robin and her presentation. Thank you for joining us today, Robin. Hey, welcome. Well, good morning. Um, well, as was mentioned in the introduction, I do work for the Naval Facilities Engineering Systems Command. Uh, we call it NAFAC for short. And what I want to do this morning is, is try to pull that, that thread, that, that, that engineering thread down a little closer to the ground level and talk a bit about our mechanics of how it is that NAFAC um, engages our allies and our partners. So next slide. Um, so as a facility systems command, our, our primary purpose is, is quite straightforward. We, we, we design and we deliver the infrastructure for the US Navy and the Marine Corps. Um, we can do this for others upon request, but that's our primary focus. And what enables us and what, what that entails is that we provide engineering and construction services under three, three main authorities authorizes to do this. And the first is, is the regulatory ability that charges NAFAC as a DOD design and construction agent for military construction, MILCON is what we referred to. And then we have a whole host of acquisition authorities as a systems command. And that allows us to purchase or enter into contracts to procure a whole a wide, wide range of goods and services, from real estate leases to equipment to materials and, and, and labor and the such. And we're able to do this at here in the United States, but also abroad. Now, when we work abroad, um, in specifically in foreign locations, we generally do this under um, our third, third significant um, authority, and that's our expeditionary and logistics authorities. Um, and these generally include support for humanitarian assistance, disaster response, or even um, through uh, support exercise related uh, engagements uh, through exercise related construction. And these services are by and large, um, mostly or typically provided by our contingency engineers and our Naval Construction Forces, uh, better known as the CV. Uh, next slide, please. And while these authorities 
um, authorize us to work around the globe, our focus at NAFAC is in the Indo-Pacific region. And, and this is in part due that NAFAC is one of two primary DOD construction agents, um, the other being the Army Corps of Engineers. But NAFAC is a designated lead agent for this Indo-PACOM area of the world. Um, and what we're seeing is a, a rise in demand specifically for DOD humanitarian assistance and disaster response support. Um, and this includes the associated engineering and construction. This is probably not surprising in that there are a significant number of some of the most vulnerable countries in the world are located in this region. Um, and what we're seeing is in, the, in recent years, record-breaking number of catastrophic disasters. This is also an area where you have huge, dense populations located in deltaic or low-lying coastal cities or, or on atolls. Um, and even small islands, isolated islands in, throughout the Pacific. And many of these are in developing countries with limited resources and capabilities. Uh, next slide, please. So how does NAFAC actually get involved? What, what are some of, uh, what's the process for that? So in the case of emergency or these disasters, um, when a declaration of disaster is made, the Secretary of State or USAID will send a request, a formal request to the Department of Defense um, for, for what they call unique capabilities or unique DOD capabilities. And um, that call for support uh, goes to the Secretary of Defense's office. And if the Secretary of Defense determines that the DOD is able, and more importantly, that it's appropriate for us to, to provide those services, they will issue an executive order to our geographic, the respective geographic combatant command. Um, in our case, again, it's the Indo-Pacific or in, Indo-PACOM. And this, this executive order will authorize the type of support as well as typically the duration of the kinds of support that DOD has agreed to provide. And it is from these geographic combatant commanders um, that and that NAFAC receives a request for support for contingency engineering and, and construction. Um, and this typically entails the deployment of teams, both military and civilian, so that would be our, our engineers as well as our CVs that uh, conduct damage assessment reports, assessment, they may clear debris, uh, in, in the wake of a recent disaster. They'll make temporary repairs to very critical infrastructure um, and bring those essential services back online, you know, water, electricity, uh, communication, to aid in more robust relief efforts. However, in some cases, especially in um, very significant um, emergencies or disasters, NAFAC, NAFAC teams will continue to provide engineering, construction management, even logistic ship to shore services throughout the recovery period. And, and in fact, this was the case um, in response to the 2010 uh, earthquake in Haiti, where our teams were actually deployed for a full three months there. So next slide, please. But, now, in fact, I want to make sure it's clear that our engagement is simply not just in emergency situations. It's not limited to that. Um, we, we use our engineering and construction support and we support more enduring activities, um, things like the Pacific Partnership, which is probably one of the longest running, certainly the largest multinational humanitarian assistance disaster relief preparedness missions. And the goal of those mi that mission is to increase the local technical capabilities and response capabilities, usually through um, either humanitarian assistance and disaster response training, as well as security cooperation exercises. 
And unlike the, the quick turn emergency situations, um, the projects that we provide in support of the Pacific Partnership um, are actually programmed and planned. They're, they're planned ahead of time. Um, again, these focus, these efforts generally focus on repairing or constructing the specific logistical infrastructure that's needed to support that, that training exercise. Um, again, that's referred to what I called, what I mentioned pre four um, exercise related construction. Um, these projects tend to be on the smaller scale. They include things like um, warehouses and staging areas. Maybe it's a repair to a port or a new pier, uh, airfields. Uh, sometimes an extension is required, hospitals, roadways, and any logistics uh, infrastructure that's going to support the successful exercise. Um, and uh, this generally, the division of labor here is NAFAC will do the engineering design and maybe contract management if we are procuring. While most of the labor, a lot of the supplies, which I think Ms. Loomis uh, mentioned earlier, we're working to have more of those in situ, um, those are provided locally through local vendors. And so that kind of on the ground cooperation, like, like the exercise itself, um, helps build our partners' technical capabilities. Um, it provides opportunity at the, at the project level. We there's ability to transfer knowledge and new techniques. Uh, are there innovative materials? Are there best practices? And this, this is beyond the job or through subject matter expert exchanges. And in those exchanges, um, very often we're, we're talking about and covering the latest technologies and strategies for addressing those existential threats of, of climate change. How do you, what's the best practice for protecting that coastal? How do you deal with the saltwater intrusion that's really chronic across the, the, the Pacific, particularly those low-lying atolls? And all this, um, all this together, it, it really is the full picture. It's the techn technical assistance, as well as that actual delivery of improved infrastructure or capital and system, that together, those help build a greater adaptive capacity of our partners and allies. Um, it enables the civil and the uh, military authorities, as well as the, even the communities themselves to be more effective first responders. Um, and ultimately, this, this is increasing the resiliency of a very, very vulnerable location and region of the world. Next slide, please. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Thank you so much to Ms. Robin O'Connell for her discussion on contingency engineering. I'd like to really identify, not only did I like her kind of immediate response perspective as well as resilience building. Next, we would like to talk to Commander Ian Sutherland, who is the officer in charge of Navy entomology. He'll be sharing a discussion on how the Navy looks at vector-borne diseases. Commander Sutherland, thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, and, and thank you very much for, for that introduction. I'm, I'm grateful to speak with you. Uh, for those who aren't familiar uh, with NISI, we're the DOD's only center devoted exclusively to vector-borne diseases, and that's largely due to our close association and on-the-ground support uh, to the Marine Corps. We're, we're not a hospital-based asset. That being said, um, I, I'd like to talk with you with a few things that uh, you, you might have heard before a few things that you haven't heard of, and with any luck, one or two things uh, you'd like to know more about. Next slide, please. Get that pesky DOD disclaimer out of the way. I'm, I'm not set in policy here. Next slide, please. Uh, Vector-borne disease. Uh, there's no surprises uh, on this one, but I'd like to uh, highlight a few things. Vector-borne diseases are extremely well-known mission stopping operational threats. Given that uh, of the roughly 4 billion people who are at risk of infection, 
or sometimes even death, they overwhelmingly live in exactly the kinds of places we tend to deploy our forces. Finally, I'd also like to emphasize that while malaria is a very important mosquito-borne parasite, it is only one of many that continue to plague our personnel. There's viruses, there's bacteria, there's the full gamut of, of vectors and, and vector-borne pathogens that uh, we and, and our allies uh, across the world must face. Next slide, please. When, when we look at the changing climate and vector-borne disease, it is a true polycrisis. Yes, even the environment is impacted. It, it brings more water, flooding, and opening up habitat to spread vectors. That's, that's intuitive. However, as ectothermic creatures are cold-blooded, this also changes their biology. This change in temperature enhances their reproduction. It shortens the time required for them to become infectious, enhancing both their biting behavior, growth of pathogens, and many other facets. So as these climatically enhanced insurgents spread to new zones, they're also exposing new host populations, humans and animals, to pathogens that previously they haven't encountered and they have developed little to no immunity. The bottom line here is mosquitoes and other vectors love the way climate change is going. So ne next slide, please. As, as previously mentioned, not only are we seeing faster, hungrier, more infectious vectors spreading into new areas, we're encountering their pathogens. Uh, the, these include newly described pathogens previously unknown to science. We're seeing vectors and their pathogens following new trade routes, belting in and out of key countries all along the road uh, to economic development. Uh, after much study, um, I, have, I have one based at, at the bottom of this slide here. After much study of the implication of climate change here, especially in very interesting places such as Hanan Island, uh, China has already woken up to this fact, prioritized their efforts, and after much work, the WHO declared it malaria-free in June of 2021. These are all very curious developments. Uh, ne next slide, please. So we know climate change is pushing the spread of vectors and vector-borne diseases, but unfortunately, that's not the end of the story. As these vectors and disease spread, so will local efforts to attempt to control them. This means an increase in the most affordable control measure for these nations, an increase in the use of pesticides. Barring a major vaccine breakthrough, which always seems to be just five or 10 years away, we have always used pesticides. And our profile of pesticides has changed very little since the turn of the last century. And this has always resulted in some pesticide resistance. However, we now face an ever-increasing bottleneck, both on the handful of techniques, I have a few of them, them listed there, as well as the classes of pesticides that we can effectively use. Again, handfuls we're, we're talking about. Next slide, please. Our toolkit, which also means the world's toolkit, is, is limited and remains limited. Uh, the, the chart we have here, this time series chart from a 2021 survey of 164 countries shows that when it comes to pesticide usage, we overwhelmingly use two main techniques against vectors, treated bed nets in, in, in the blue section and indoor residual spraying, the yellow section. Unfortunately, both rely heavily on one and only one main class of pesticide. Next slide, slide please. This visual from that same study shows how stovepiped we are with our interventions. Not many choices here, and the more expensive newer insecticides like the neonics are, are very poorly adopted simply because of cost. On the left chart, it shows Africa's overwhelming reliance on pyrethroids. On the right, the chart shows combined 
the rest of the world's reliance on periphroids. And curiously enough, in the dark blue band down there, uh, the organochlorines, which is also known as DDT. These are the two frontline interventions of choice despite restrictions and, and other treaties uh, based on this. And, and this is swiftly enhancing the spread of insecticide resistance. Next slide, please. Now, if we map this resistance over time, even for one species and one region, we can dramatically see how quickly confirmed pesticide resistance takes hold, going from green to red. Let's take a quick second to look at that. It's patterns uh, sh shamefully obvious. Uh, unfortunately, anyone who has deployed might be a little disappointed to learn that our uniforms are treated with pyrethroid derivatives, the same, same ones that are being classified resistant there uh, in this map. H however, this isn't all climate change doom and gloom. The takeaway here is resistance is not inevitable. Ne next slide, please. We know what the outlook is for destabilization, Oconus, and nations in crisis, but we are able to correct this. However, it requires deliberate effort. This will require changing our training, modernizing surveillance, and no longer paying lip service to carefully monitoring and rotating our insecticide usage. It now needs to be at the forefront of how we train and how we operate. Additionally, our partner nations and foreign allies need to be on the same page. We're in this together. And to that end, NISI is engaged in 24 projects in over 15 countries across all COCOMs. We collaborate with nearly 60 domestic and foreign military, academic, and industry partners. Our full, our full portfolio isn't on the slide there, but we are actively assessing and bringing new technologies out of the laboratory and into the field to both identify and respond to insecticide resistance and vector threats. The Insecticide Resistance and Response System, or IRIS, and Gator Dawn, our field training exercises, are key facets of this work, especially to cross-train with allied nations. And I'm very happy to say uh, we're currently engaging with the US CDC uh, in the Marshall Islands uh, for some control strategies, uh, we're developing plan of actions with Australia, Vietnam, and Laos for, for additional work, uh, as, as well as future engagements uh, in Diego Garcia. Uh, we will continue to build additional activity with our international partners, sharing these measures and techniques we're developing, and hope that you'll support and, and join us. Uh, next slide, please. As a final thought, I'd like to leave you with two quotes on the screen there concerning our last great power competition that went kinetic. Uh, if, if we indeed find ourselves again on an island hopping near peer conflict with sailors, CVs, Marines, and, and other war fighters slogging across contested battle space, uh, we cannot afford to have our force health protection arsenal firing blanks against humanity's oldest foe. And with that, um, I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Commander Sutherland. We would like to invite uh, Dr. Mark Spector from the Office of Naval Research to go camera on, Ms. Robin O'Connell, and Mr. Vince Sobash from the Naval Construct uh, Engineering side. And Commander Sutherland, thank you for remaining on the line. We will start to field questions. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. The earlier you do, the, the more likely I might be to get to them. There was another question about the possibility of creating fuel at sea from seawater or atmospheric carbon. Do you know if there's any work in that category? Yeah, I, I mentioned that. Maybe I didn't uh, uh, emphasize that enough. Certainly, that's part of our blue, blue carbon program is looking at, at scaling up uh, the electrolysis uh, um, approaches to to generating um hydrogen from or carbon dioxide out of out of the atmosphere and also out of the seawater and then uh converting that into fuel so we are looking at that technology and looking at how much that technology can be scaled we have a robust program in that area 
Excellent. Mark, if, if those technologies come online, are they something that can plug into existing kind of ship infrastructure or will we have to kind of take out part of the, the current engineering in a ship and, and replace it with something else? Um, well, this would, we'd be looking at generating, a, 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 not a, not generating on the ship, but generating an offboard platform, either a barge or a separate ship. Um, and then in, in the end, hopefully you, you um, end up with a drop in replacement fuel that could then be uh, used directly by our combatants. Excellent. Drop in replacement fuel. I've heard that uh, both for ships and for aircraft. Thank you so much, Mark. Now I'd like to go to Robin and Vince. We have a question here about what the DOD and NAVFAC can do in advance of a disaster to assist allies and partners to be better able to withstand and respond to future disasters and also participate in contingency operations. So I'll let Robin answer first and then I'll go to Vince. Oh, thank you for the question. Um, I, I think as I was talking a little bit about our engagement in the more enduring efforts like Pacific partnerships and many, many more, whether it's an exchange of, of talent and expertise, we work ahead of that curve with some of the preparedness work. So it's not just that we're coming in to just patch things up, but we work with our allies and our partners um, and even U.S. territories and other folks abroad to build infrastructure that will not only help with our interoperability, but also with security cooperation. They serve, that's a, that, that more robust infrastructure that we put in place ahead of time is what really helps move the needle and helps us deal with um, the contingency that will be a, a disaster someday. That, that, that by itself is inherently um, capability building. And if for a ground sort of truth and example, I mean, uh, Vince, Vince can, he's been there right there on the ground and he can tell you uh, <laughs> lots of stories there. Excellent. So as a reminder, joining us for the NAVFAC perspectives is the NAVFAC's chief contingency engineer, Mr. Vince Sobosh. So I'd like to go ahead and get your answer to that question, Vince. Uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction. And, and Robin, thanks for the kind words as well. Um, yeah, we we do a variety of um, both subject matter expert exchanges and also um, actual projects. So they range from things like helping island nations uh, develop microgrid strategies to to working with. Uh, we recently had a climate related uh, symposium in Vietnam where we actually reviewed PhD student dissertations together with their faculty to see how they related to um, issues that we've also identified in some of our work. Uh, we also are working with um, some innovation with materials. I, and I, I like to say this, uh, next to water, the second most used material in the world is concrete. And concrete, uh, affects climate change on both sides of the equation. So one of the areas where we're doing some work is with uh, carbonate cements. Uh, carbonate cements help on one side of the equation in that they're much lower energy kiln uh, temperatures. Uh, so we can generate uh, the cement with much less uh, carbon emission. And on the other side of the equation, uh, that material constantly sequesters CO2 from the atmosphere as long as it's exposed to the, the atmosphere. So um, it has particular benefits in terms of uh, disaster response, but also military applications. So for airfield damage repair and for port damage repair, uh, carbonate cements uh, produce very high strength concretes that are very resilient to uh, saltwater effects, things like that. So. Uh, we're trying to work across a fairly broad spectrum, and I and I could talk way longer than we have time for, so I'll I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Excellent answer, Vince. Uh, fascinating about the concrete. Thank you. I'd like to go next to Commander Ian Sutherland. 
Um, you were talking a lot, of course, about vector-borne diseases, uh, and you focus on the pesticides. There's a notion that this might run counter to some of how we're addressing the biodiversity cr crisis or water security issues or health, uh, human health in, in implications. So I just wanted to give you a chance to, you've seen the question in the chat, to give your perspective on how these programs relate. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Uh, it, it's exciting because it, it actually parallel each other and, and dovetail precisely um, well with one another. Uh, the whole point is that we do not want to succumb to a spray and pray um, technique uh, that many people resort to in the face of insecticide resistance. They think, oh, okay, I'll, I'll spray a little bit. A little bit is good, more is better. Uh, the science doesn't support that at all. And as a matter of fact, we wanna make sure that we're closely monitoring what is used, how it is used, and making sure it's the most appropriate one at that time. Uh, that is part of the double whammy of climate change and diversity here in that if improperly used, these uh, materials and agents can damage the environment. So we are uh, doubly required to keep our efforts uh, within uh, all um, environmental and, and health considerations. So uh, this is actually uh, exactly what we were talking about. We don't want them. Thank you so much, Ian. I'd like to ask each of you a question. Uh, it was similar to when I asked the leaders earlier, which is a, a tangible example of what you could be doing more that you haven't mentioned with allies and partners, or perhaps something you're excited about doing in the future. So I think we'll um, go around again, perhaps start with Mark, maybe talk about your NATO engagement or another piece of your, your portfolio, and then we'll go to construction. And then uh, Ian, finally, Mark, would you like to start? Uh, sure. Well, I, I think um, these questions about how we design our future platforms, particularly our surface uh, combatants, uh, to be more resilient to uh, changing climate, to be able to operate in in higher sea state, to be able to re replenish, refuel, rearm in higher sea state, um, be able to be um, operated at high, potentially higher air and seawater temperatures and 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 uh, you know we already have overburdened air conditioning uh, facilities on our ships um so these questions as to what the future environment we ha have to operate on and, and standardizing with our allies um sort of the, the design goals um and the potential where we think we're going to be operating i think is a, is an area that's uh um uh, important for us to work again, work with our allies and, and partners in this area. Um, and that's sort of, um, as I mentioned, I have this one year, which is sort of, uh, activity within the NATO context, which is just sort of just scoping what our uh, partners are doing and how they're thinking about these problems, and then trying to come up with some commonality and, and recommendations for future uh, um, activities or other forms for um, for standardizing these kinds of things. Thanks, Mark. I'm always impressed with how much uh, travel you're doing because of so much engagement with allies and partners. Um, Robin and then Vince. And yeah, um, well, there's always room to do a lot more uh, engagement with our, our allies and our partners. Um, and there's never, there's never an end to the backlog of projects to repair this, that, or the other piece of infrastructure. But one of the areas that I think we could make a big difference is, is maybe taking a step back from the project and going back to the planning process that helps set up um, sort of that longer programmatic view to, again, to anticipate, help our allies and our partners with that planning capability so they're anticipating what they're going to need. And they can roll that out and seek funding and seek assistance in a more I guess programmatic and orderly, orderly fashion, where it's not just the project by project or reactive um, situation um, because they're on a shoestring. Uh, if they had a plan in hand, they could then seek perhaps more assistance more effectively and some of the, the inter intersections 
and more holistic approach might might serve serve us all well. Thank you, Robin. Vince. Um, so yeah, as, as Robin said, there, there's certainly a, a great amount of opportunity for building partner capacity, and you know we we are seeing a much larger. Uh, the current NDA um, has expansion of the 10 USC 333 authority for building partner capacity. So we are looking to do a lot more work related to security cooperation with everybody around the world, essentially. And, and certainly many of us that risk, high at risk countries in the, in the South Pacific. Um, so that's an area where we're, we're, we're looking to do a lot more work right away, essentially. And, and I'll kind of also use this to answer one of the questions in the Q&A section. Um, exercise related construction is more than just uh, construction associated with a large scale exercise. So we are also expanding the types of things we're doing with CBs and other military construction forces uh, to improve their ability to work in some of these regions and also to work with uh, innovative materials such as the carbonate cements where we can uh, take better advantage of indigenously available materials. So, so that benefits us in wartime as well as what we're doing to prepare. Because um, again, one of the things I didn't mention is carbonate cement can actually be produced by uh, using rubble from existing concrete uh, damage. So again, many opportunities there. And, I, and I'll share a quick anecdote with you, uh, kind of to Robin's point about working with planning and that. After um, the super typhoon Haiyan, uh, we did a, a workshop in the Philippines, in Tacloban, in one of the main cities that was severely affected by that. And we had a bunch of people who were actually protesting what we were doing. And those protesters, some of them came into our sessions later on. And so I had a chance to ask him, I said, well, what's the deal here? You, you're protesting, now you're sitting in. He said, well, we were actually paid by the Chinese to protest the American you know, presence here, but we greatly value the fact that you're willing to work with us and teach us rather than just trying to bring in your own projects or do things that are you know, just clearly for your own self-interest. So again, I'll kind of stop with that little anecdote. So thank you. Thanks for the anecdote, Vince. I'd like to go to Commander Sutherland again. Um, can you speak about the potential for leveraging integrated pest management strategies, biological controls, and ecological management strategies to address the range shifting and burgeoning populations of vectors? Um, it's particularly in the context of forward-looking technology advancement over the historical arsenal of chemicals. Uh, I'd like you to go ahead and hear your answer to that question. Yes, absolutely. Um, as, as it's uh, abbreviated, integrated pest management, that's, that's exactly uh, what's required here. As I mentioned in the presentation, we can no longer play lip service to uh, how things has, has been done in the past. We've talked about rotating things. We've talked about integrated vector management uh, as a counter point to IPM there. Um, they're, they're needed now more than ever. And uh, based on the data that was shown, we're at an inflection point where we can no longer afford to ignore this, both uh, environmentally and from a public health standpoint. So yes, it's, it's absolutely needed. Thanks, Ian. Now I'd like to go to Mark. Mark, you talked a lot about science and technology. I'd like to hear more about the pathways for industry, both small and large, and for academics to engage in naval research uh, opportunities. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a great question. Um, I would say the first thing you can do is go to our website. We, we just revamped it last year, and I think there's a lot of useful information. It's much more user-friendly. I put a link in the box to uh, a list of all the science and technology programs at an ONR. And if you click on any of them, it will provide you um, the contact information at ONR. 
Um, and, um, you know, my colleagues, we, we have a great group of program officers at ONR, and they're really tuned in to what's going on across not just the U.S., but across but across uh, internationally. And, um, you know, they can help point you in the right direction. Um, one of the things we're looking into is, is developing a consortium of, uh, of academics and small businesses um, to address these tough challenges related to operational um, decarbonization and to, to, to take a survey of, you know, what, where are the commercial technologies out there and which are could be integrated into Navy platforms? Um, what are some of the emerging ideas coming um, from our university system? And again, to try and uh, pick the, the um, promising ones and, and, and help develop those and potentially um, um, demonstrate those in some, you know, integrated fashion. So I've been working with uh, Kristen Fletcher, who leads the uh, climate uh, working team um, at the Naval Postgraduate School on putting together this idea of, of some of a, of a consortium. Um, so anybody that's interested in more information on that, feel free to reach out to me or to Kristen. Um, you can Google uh, her and I'm sure her, her email will pop up. Um, and we're, we're certainly, I think large businesses know how to reach out to us. It's sometimes the small and non-traditional players that don't. Um, but I'm happy to discuss offline with any of them uh, potential funding mechanisms uh, to support their work. Thank you, Mark. Now, I, I'm going to go backwards uh, through our speakers with our final question for today. I think Vince's anecdote earlier kind of highlighted potential competition with uh, China in particular. But do you see anywhere in your respective areas where traditional competitors might actually have an opportunity to cooperate in some of these uh, in your respective fields of expertise. Ian, you get to take that one first. <laughs> yeah, we've, uh, we, we have a very broad global uh, footprint and portfolio. Uh, we're always open uh, in the scientific field to exchange and, and share lessons learned uh, with everyone. And as I mentioned, we're, we're all in this together and especially in our field, uh, these uh, wing-borne uh, weapons of mass destruction, they, res they, they respect no borders, and uh, we need all the help we can get to combat them. Thanks, Ian. Robin, would you like to answer the question about potential cooperation with competitors? Um, yes. Uh, I've, well, I think in any emergency response, what, um, uh, particularly if it involves human lives at risk, whether it's a search and rescue, um, trying to help with critical supplies, that there's always room for putting aside the traditional competition and working under the same umbrella to, to help specifically when there's lives at stake. Um, and we can do that in, th there's a lot there with that that emergency situation, but there may be opportunities in, in scientific endeavors that help with early warning systems. Again, when, when it's under the umbrella of, of human lives, and um, I think we, we can find room to cooperate with each other. Thank you, Robin. Vince? Yeah, I, I, that's exactly right. And, and while it's not specifically climate related, um, the recent, I think it was 2014, 2015, earthquake in uh, Nepal, um, we were doing some work to try to come up with a more effective uh, uh, retrofit options for the type of stone construction they do in that country. And we were working to do some uh, testing at UCSD and University of Nevada, Reno, but we were having trouble getting the funding streams worked out and we actually did collaborate. The Chinese did the testing for the Nepalese, and we 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 collaborated very effectively on that. And and there are areas where climate related specifically, uh, we, we are able to work together. And and as you say, that th this is for the whole world, and, and we need to f do more of that. Um, and and just real quick, there was a question about the USC three 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 only being mill to mill. NAVFAC, because we're a DOD construction agent, our authorities actually allow us to do work that's funded by, uh, like uh, for island nations. We do projects for civilian population that are funded 
by the Office of Insular Affairs associated with the compact states funding and that. So uh, there, there are authorities and capabilities that we're able to do that. So just real quick response to that as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Vince. And I invite all my speakers, we, we will wrap up, but they can um, any questions we might not have gotten to, they can type an answer in um, soon. Mark, I'd like you to take the, the, the question and, and wrap us up about uh, the potential for um, perhaps somehow cooperating with competitors in some of your areas. Oh, well, Maybe yeah. less likely in science and technology, but I'd love to hear if there's any room. <laughs> Well, we, we certainly, um, a number of our performers and uh, collaborate um, with academics in nations where we may may not have great relationships with, but but uh, at an academic level, it's very an open community and collaborating. Um, we generally do not fund research in these nations, but... Uh, <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, one of the reasons I, I like that question in particular is, you know, it's very good to focus on our allies and partners, but in a lot of aspects of the climate space where it's affecting the global system, it, we all have to be working in the same direction, even with our competitors in certain areas. And we saw some areas, perhaps in science technology, a little less likely with construction and engineering, maybe a little more likely. And then with vector-borne disease, how important it is because you know they those uh, weapons of mass destruction, as Ian mentioned, don't respect any of our borders as we've seen in the last couple of years. I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Mark Spector, Robin O'Connell, Vince Sobosh, and Commander Ian Sutherland for joining our panel today. Thank you for bringing your respective areas of expertise and really diving deep down both into your fields of study as well as um, the international engagements that you've done. I invite you at this time, you can go camera off and I will wrap up. Thank you all for the to the panelists. Well, I'd like to thank them as well as our other speakers today, starting off the event with uh, Vice Admiral Williamson, Rear Admiral Beatty, and Ms. Loomis. One of the reasons I organized this event was to showcase naval action in climate change. Uh, we started today with leadership vision and big picture policy, and we concluded with these very specific programs. My key takeaways are twofold. Uh, first, Vice Admiral Williamson shared that when we talk about climate change, we always have to finish the sentence with the impact to operations. The operational impact therefore carried through all of our presentations today. And second, by intent, this wasn't meant to be kind of a unilateral US leadership so showcase. We wanted to have the discussion in the context of foreign partner engagement with our allies and partners. And thanks to all of the speakers who brought that home in your own respective ways. At this point, I'd like to once again thank the sponsor of our event, Professor Peter Dabrowski, who is the William B. Ruger Chair of National Security Economics and the Naval War College Foundation for making today's conference happen. Uh, by being virtual, we are able to bring together experts from out, across the force and the world and record this uh, for people to access. So this event will be posted on the Naval War College YouTube site. That's really important as much as I uh, really thank everyone who has joined us live today. We get almost four times more views by posting a recording. And the whole intent of my work is to give some of this information to the broadest audience possible. So thank you for everyone for joining us virtually and for those who are watching it uh, at a later time. Once again, I'd like to uh, thank my speakers and moderators uh, for today and the special events team, Karen, Michonne, and especially Carolyn, the technical support from Dean, Mark, and Jason, the public affairs office, media services, alumni programs, my team with the climate and human security group, and Dr. Bush, and also Lieutenant Commander Dave Nostro, who is taking notes for us today. On that note, we will have a conference report that will be published and in it will include the slides from all of our presentations. While I was on camera today, it took a large event, a team to make this event happen and I couldn't have done it without any one of them. Thank you so much for joining us today. I, everyone stay safe. And this will conclude our third virtual conference on the national security significance of climate change 
with the specific theme of naval climate engagement. Thank you all for joining us.